state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury January 2022, U.S. Department of the Treasury The overview of the final rule provides a summary of major provisions of the final rule for informational purposes and is intended as a brief, simplified user guide to the final rule provisions. The descriptions provided in this document summarize key provisions of the final rule but are non-exhaustive, do not describe all terms and conditions associated with the use of SLFRF, and do not describe all requirements that may apply to this funding. Any SLFRF funds received are also subject to the terms and conditions of the agreement entered into by Treasury and the respective jurisdiction, which incorporate the provisions of the final rule and the guidance that implements this program. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 2, U.S. Department of the Treasury Contents Introduction, 4 Overview of the Program, 6 Replacing Lost Public Sector Revenue, 9 Responding to Public Health and Economic Impacts of COVID, 19, 12 Responding to the Public Health Emergency, 14 Responding to Negative Economic Impacts, 16 Assistance to Households, 17. Assistance to small businesses, 21. Assistance to non-profits, 23. Aid to impacted industries, 24. Public sector capacity, 26. Public safety, public health, and human services staff, 26. Government employment and rehiring public sector staff, 27. Effective service delivery, 28. Capital expenditures, 30. Framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated. 32 premium pay, 35 water and sewer, infrastructure, 37 broadband infrastructure, 39 restrictions on use, 41 program administration, 43 coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 3, U.S. Department of the Treasury introduction the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, SLFRF, a part of the American Rescue Plan, delivers $350 billion to state, local, and tribal governments across the country to support their response to and recovery from the COVID-19 public health emergency. The program ensures that governments have the resources needed to fight the pandemic and support families and businesses struggling with its public health and economic impacts, maintain vital public services, even amid declines in revenue, and build a strong, resilient, an equitable recovery by making investments that support long-term growth and opportunity. Early program implementation In May 2021, Treasury published the Interim Final Rule, IFR, describing eligible and ineligible uses of funds, as well as other program provisions, sought feedback from the public on these program rules, and began to distribute funds. The IFR went immediately into effect in May, and since then, Governments have used SLFRF funds to meet their immediate pandemic response needs and begin building a strong and equitable recovery, such as through providing vaccine incentives, development of affordable housing, and construction of infrastructure to deliver safe and reliable water. As governments began to deploy this funding in their communities, Treasury carefully considered the feedback provided through its public comment process and other forums. Treasury received over 1,500 comments participated in hundreds of meetings, and received correspondence from a wide range of governments and other stakeholders. Key changes and clarifications in the final rule The final rule delivers broader flexibility and greater simplicity in the program, responsive to feedback in the comment process. Among other clarifications and changes, the final rule provides the features below. Replacing lost public sector revenue The final rule offers a standard allowance for revenue loss of up to $10 million, allowing recipients to select between a standard amount of revenue loss or complete a full revenue loss calculation. Recipients that select the standard allowance may use that amount, in many cases their full award, for government services, with streamlined reporting requirements. Public health and economic impacts in addition to programs and services, the final rule clarifies that recipients can use funds for capital expenditures that support an eligible COVID-19 public health or economic response. For example, recipients may build certain affordable housing, childcare facilities, schools, hospitals, and other projects consistent with final rule requirements. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury for U.S. Department of the Treasury in addition, 
the final rule provides an expanded set of households and communities that are presumed to be impacted and disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, thereby allowing recipients to provide responses to a broad set of households and entities without requiring additional analysis. Further, the final rule provides a broader set of uses available for these communities as part of COVID-19 public health and economic response, including making affordable housing, childcare, early learning, and services to address learning loss during the pandemic eligible in all impacted communities and making certain community development and neighborhood revitalization activities eligible for disproportionately impacted communities. Further, the final rule allows for a broader set of uses to restore and support government employment, including hiring above a recipient's pre-pandemic baseline, providing funds to employees that experienced pay cuts or furloughs, avoiding layoffs, and providing retention incentives. Premium pay The final rule delivers more streamlined options to provide premium pay, by broadening the share of eligible workers who can receive premium pay without a written justification while maintaining a focus on lower income and frontline workers performing essential work, water, sewer and broadband infrastructure The final rule significantly broadens eligible broadband infrastructure investments to address challenges with broadband access, affordability, and reliability, and adds additional eligible water and sewer infrastructure investments, including a broader range of lead remediation and stormwater management projects. Final rule effective date The final rule takes effect on April 1st, 2022. Until that time, the interim final rule remains in effect. Funds used consistently with the IFR while it is in effect are in compliance with the SLFRF program. However, recipients can choose to take advantage of the final rule's flexibilities and simplifications now, even ahead of the effective date. Treasury will not take action to enforce the interim final rule to the extent that a use of funds is consistent with the terms of the final rule regardless of when the SLFRF funds were used. Recipients may consult the statement regarding compliance with the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds interim final rule and final rule, which can be found on Treasury's website. For more information on compliance with the interim final rule and the final rule, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 5, U.S. Department of the Treasury Overview of the Program The Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, SLFRF, program provides substantial flexibility for each jurisdiction to meet local needs within the four separate eligible use categories. This overview of the final rule addresses the four eligible use categories ordered from the broadest and most flexible to the most specific. Recipients may use SLFRF funds to replace lost public sector revenue. Using this funding to provide government services up to the amount of revenue loss due to the pandemic, recipients may determine their revenue loss by choosing between two options, a standard allowance of up to $10 million in aggregate, not to exceed their award amount, during the program, calculating their jurisdiction's specific revenue loss each year using Treasury's formula, which compares actual revenue to a counterfactual trend. Recipients may use funds up to the amount of revenue loss for government services, generally, services traditionally provided by recipient governments are government services. Unless Treasury has stated otherwise, support the COVID-19 public health and economic response by addressing COVID-19 and its impact on public health as well as addressing economic harms to households, small businesses, non-profits, impacted industries, and the public sector. Recipients can use funds for programs, services, or capital expenditures that respond to the public health and negative economic impacts of the pandemic. To provide simple and clear eligible uses of funds, Treasury provides a list of enumerated uses that recipients can provide to households, populations, or classes, that is, groups, that experienced pandemic impacts. Public health eligible uses include COVID-19 mitigation and prevention, medical expenses, behavioral health care, and preventing and responding to violence. Eligible uses to respond to negative economic impacts are organized by the type of beneficiary, assistance to households, small businesses, and non-profits. Each category includes assistance for impacted and disproportionately impacted classes. Impacted classes experienced the general, broad-based impacts of the pandemic. While disproportionately impacted classes faced meaningfully more severe impacts, often due to pre-existing disparities, to simplify administration, 
the final rule presumes that some populations and groups were impacted or disproportionately impacted and are eligible for responsive services. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 6, U.S. Department of the Treasury, eligible uses for assistance to impacted households include aid for re-employment, job training, food, rent, mortgages, utilities, affordable housing development, childcare, early education, addressing learning loss, and many more uses. Eligible uses for assistance to impacted small businesses or non-profits include loans or grants to mitigate financial hardship, technical assistance for small businesses, and many more uses. Recipients can also provide assistance to impacted industries like travel, tourism, and hospitality that faced substantial pandemic impacts, or address impacts to the public sector, for example by re-hiring public sector workers cut during the crisis, recipients providing funds for enumerated uses to populations and groups that Treasury has presumed eligible are clearly operating consistently with the final rule. Recipients can also identify, 1. Other populations or groups, beyond those presumed eligible, that experienced pandemic impacts or disproportionate impacts and, 2. Other programs, services, or capital expenditures, beyond those enumerated, to respond to those impacts, provide premium pay for eligible workers performing essential work, offering additional support to those who have and will bear the greatest health risks because of their service in critical sectors, recipients may provide premium pay to eligible workers, generally those working in person and key economic sectors, who are below a wage threshold or non-exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime provisions, or if the recipient submits justification that the premium pay is responsive to workers performing essential work, invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, making necessary investments to improve access to clean drinking water, to support vital wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, and to expand affordable access to broadband internet, recipients may fund a broad range of water and sewer projects, including those eligible under the EPA's Clean Water State Revolving Fund, EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, and certain additional projects, including a wide set of lead remediation, stormwater infrastructure, and aid for private wells and septic units, recipients may fund high-speed broadband infrastructure in areas of need that the recipient identifies, such as areas without access to adequate speeds, affordable options, or where connections are inconsistent or unreliable, completed projects must participate in a low-income subsidy program. While recipients have considerable flexibility to use funds to address the diverse needs of their communities, some restrictions on use apply across all eligible use categories. These include, for states and territories, no offsets of a reduction in net tax revenue resulting from a change in state or territory law. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 7, U.S. Department of the Treasury, for all recipients except for tribal governments, no extraordinary contributions to a pension fund for the purpose of reducing an accrued, unfunded liability, for all recipients, no payments for debt service and replenishments of rainy day funds, no satisfaction of settlements and judgments, no uses that contravene or violate the American Rescue Plan Act, uniform guidance conflicts of interest requirements, and other federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Under the SLFRF program, funds must be used for costs incurred on or after March 3, 2021. Further, funds must be obligated by December 31, 2024, and expended by December 31, 2026. This time period, during which recipients can expend SLFRF funds, is the period of performance, in addition to SLFRF. The American Rescue Plan includes other sources of funding for state and local governments, including the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund to fund critical capital investments including broadband infrastructure, the Homeowner Assistance Fund to provide relief for our country's most vulnerable homeowners, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program to assist households that are unable to pay rent or utilities, and the State Small Business Credit Initiative to fund small business credit expansion initiatives. Eligible recipients are encouraged to visit the Treasury website for more information. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 8. U.S.
Department of the Treasury replacing lost public sector revenue The coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds provide needed fiscal relief for recipients that have experienced revenue loss due to the onset of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Specifically, SLFRF funding may be used to pay for government services in an amount equal to the revenue loss experienced by the recipient due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Government services generally include any service traditionally provided by a government, including construction of roads and other infrastructure, provision of public safety and other services, and health and educational services. Funds spent under government services are subject to streamlined reporting and compliance requirements. In order to use funds under government services, recipients should first determine revenue loss. They may, then, spend up to that amount on general government services. Determining revenue loss recipients have two options for how to determine their amount of revenue loss. Recipients must choose one of the two options and cannot switch between these approaches after an election is made one. Recipients may elect a standard allowance of $10 million to spend on government services through the period of performance. Under this option, which is newly offered in the final rule Treasury presumes that up to $10 million in revenue has been lost due to the public health emergency and recipients are permitted to use that amount, not to exceed the award amount. To fund government services, the standard allowance provides an estimate of revenue loss that is based on an extensive analysis of average revenue loss across states and localities, and offers a simple, convenient way to determine revenue loss, particularly for SLFRF's smallest recipients. All recipients may elect to use this standard allowance instead of calculating lost revenue using the formula below, including those with total allocations of $10 million or less. Electing the standard allowance does not increase or decrease a recipient's total allocation to. Recipients may calculate their actual revenue loss according to the formula articulated in the final rule. Under this option, recipients calculate revenue loss at four distinct points in time, either at the end of each calendar year, for example, December 31st for years 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023 or the end of each fiscal year of the recipient. Under the flexibility provided in the final rule, recipients can choose whether to use calendar or fiscal year dates but must be consistent throughout the period of performance. Treasury has also provided several adjustments to the definition of general revenue in the final rule. To calculate revenue loss at each of these dates, recipients must follow a four-step process, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 9. U.S. Department of the Treasury A. Calculate revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year prior to the public health emergency, that is, last full fiscal year before January 27, 2020. Called the base year revenue B. Estimate counterfactual revenue, which is equal to the following formula, where N is the number of months elapsed since the end of the base year to the calculation date. 1 plus H. 12 The growth adjustment is the greater of either a standard growth rate, 5.2%, or the recipient's average annual revenue growth in the last full three fiscal years prior to the COVID-19 public health emergency C. Identify actual revenue, which equals revenues collected over the 12 months immediately preceding the calculation date. Under the final rule, recipients must adjust actual revenue totals for the effect of tax cuts and tax increases that are adopted after the date of adoption of the final rule, January 6, 2022. Specifically, the estimated fiscal impact of tax cuts and tax increases adopted after January 6, 2022, must be added or subtracted to the calculation of actual revenue for purposes of calculation dates that occur on or after April 1, 2022. Recipients may subtract from their calculation of actual revenue the effect of tax increases enacted prior to the adoption of the final rule. Note that recipients that elect to remove the effect of tax increases enacted before the adoption of the final rule must also remove the effect of tax decreases enacted before the adoption of the final rule, such that they are accurately removing the effect of tax policy changes on revenue d revenue loss for the calculation date is equal to counterfactual revenue minus actual revenue, adjusted for tax changes, for the 12-month period. If actual revenue exceeds counterfactual revenue, the loss is set to zero for that 12-month period.
Revenue loss for the period of performance is the sum of the revenue loss on for each calculation date. The supplementary information in the final rule provides an example of this calculation, which recipients may find helpful, in the revenue loss section. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 10. U.S. Department of the Treasury Spending on Government Services Recipients can use SLFRF funds on government services up to the revenue loss amount, whether that be the standard allowance amount or the amount calculated using the above approach. Government services generally include any service traditionally provided by a government, unless Treasury has stated otherwise. Here are some common examples, although this list is not exhaustive, construction of schools and hospitals road building and maintenance, and other infrastructure health services general government administration, staff, and administrative facilities environmental remediation provision of police, fire, and other public safety services, including purchase of fire trucks and police vehicles. Government services is the most flexible eligible use category under the SLFRF program, and funds are subject to streamlined reporting and compliance requirements. Recipients should be mindful that certain restrictions, which are detailed further in the restrictions on use section and apply to all uses of funds, apply to government services as well. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 11. U.S. Department of the Treasury Responding to Public Health and Economic Impacts of COVID-19 The Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds provide resources for governments to meet the public health and economic needs of those impacted by the pandemic in their communities, as well as address long-standing health and economic disparities, which amplified the impact of the pandemic and disproportionately impacted communities, resulting in more severe pandemic impacts. The eligible use category to respond to public health and negative economic impacts is organized around the types of assistance a recipient may provide and includes several subcategories, public health, assistance to households, comma assistance to small businesses, assistance to non-profits, aid to impacted industries, and public sector capacity. In general, to identify eligible uses of funds in this category, recipients should, one, Identify a COVID-19 public health or economic impact on an individual or class, that is, a group, and, two, design a program that responds to that impact. Responses should be related and reasonably proportional to the harm identified and reasonably designed to benefit those impacted. To provide simple, clear eligible uses of funds that meet this standard, Treasury provides a non-exhaustive list of enumerated uses that respond to pandemic impacts. Treasury also presumes that some populations experienced pandemic impacts and are eligible for responsive services. In other words, recipients providing enumerated uses of funds to populations presumed eligible are clearly operating consistently with the final rule. One recipients also have broad flexibility to 1. Identify and respond to other pandemic impacts and 2. Serve other populations that experienced pandemic impacts beyond the enumerated uses and presumed eligible populations. Recipients can also identify groups or classes of beneficiaries that experienced pandemic impacts and provide services to those classes. One however, please note that use of funds for enumerated uses may not be grossly disproportionate to the harm. Further, recipients should consult the capital expenditures section for more information about pursuing a capital expenditure. Please note that enumerated capital expenditures are not presumed to be reasonably proportional responses to an identified harm except as provided in the capital expenditures section. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 12, U.S. Department of the Treasury Step 1, Identify COVID-19 Public Health or Economic Impact 2, Design a Response that Addresses or Responds to the Impact Analysis, can identify impact to a specific household, business or non-profit or to a class of households, businesses, or non-profits, that is, group. Comma can also identify disproportionate impacts, or more severe impacts, to a specific beneficiary or to a class. Types of responses can include a program, service, or capital expenditure. Response should be related and reasonably proportional to the harm. Response should also be reasonably designed to benefit impacted individual or class simplifying presumptions. Final rule presumes certain populations and classes are impacted and disproportionately impacted, 
final rule provides non-exhaustive list of enumerated eligible uses that respond to pandemic impacts and disproportionate impacts to assess eligibility of uses of funds. Recipients should first determine the subcategory where their use of funds may fit, for example, public health, assistance to households, assistance to small businesses, based on the entity that experienced the health or economic impact, to then. Recipients should refer to the relevant section for more details on each subcategory. While the same overall eligibility standard applies to all uses of funds to respond to the public health and negative economic impacts of the pandemic, each subcategory has specific nuances on its application. In addition, recipients interested in using funds for capital expenditures, that is, investments in property, facilities, or equipment, should review the capital expenditures section in addition to the eligible use sub category. Recipients interested in other uses of funds, beyond the enumerated uses, should refer to the section on framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated, too for example, a recipient interested in providing aid to unemployed individuals is addressing a negative economic impact experienced by a household and should refer to the section on assistance to households. Recipients should also be aware of the difference between beneficiaries and sub-recipients. Beneficiaries are households, small businesses, or non-profits that can receive assistance based on impacts of the pandemic that they experienced. On the other hand, sub-recipients are organizations that carry out eligible uses on behalf of a government, often through grants or contracts. Sub-recipients do not need to have experienced a negative economic impact of the pandemic, rather, they are providing services to beneficiaries that experienced an impact. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 13. U.S. Department of the Treasury responding to the public health emergency while the country has made tremendous progress in the fight against COVID-19, including a historic vaccination campaign. The disease still poses a grave threat to Americans' health and the economy, providing state, local, and tribal governments the resources needed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic is a core goal of the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, as well as addressing the other ways that the pandemic has impacted public health. Treasury has identified several public health impacts of the pandemic and enumerated uses of funds to respond to impacted populations, COVID-19 mitigation and prevention. The pandemic has broadly impacted Americans and recipients can provide services to prevent and mitigate COVID-19 to the general public or to small businesses, non-profits, and impacted industries in general. Enumerated eligible uses include vaccination programs, including vaccine incentives and vaccine sites testing programs, equipment and sites monitoring, contact tracing and public health surveillance, for example, monitoring for variants. Public communication efforts Public health data systems COVID-19 prevention and treatment equipment, such as ventilators and ambulances medical and PPE protective supplies support for isolation or quarantine ventilation system installation and improvement technical assistance on mitigation of COVID-19 threats to public health and safety transportation to reach vaccination or testing sites or other prevention and mitigation services for vulnerable populations support for prevention, mitigation, or other services in congregate living facilities, public facilities, and schools support for prevention and mitigation strategies in small businesses, non-profits, and impacted industries medical facilities generally dedicated to COVID-19 treatment and mitigation, for example, ICUs, emergency rooms, temporary medical facilities and other measures to increase COVID-19 treatment capacity emergency operations centers and emergency response equipment, for example, emergency response radio systems, public telemedicine capabilities for COVID-19 related treatment coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 14, U.S. Department of the Treasury, medical expenses. Funds may be used for expenses to households, medical providers, or others that incurred medical costs due to the pandemic, including unreimbursed expenses for medical care for COVID-19 testing or treatment, such as uncompensated care costs for medical providers or out-of-pocket costs for individuals paid family and medical leave for public employees to enable compliance with COVID. 19 Public Health Precautions Emergency Medical Response Expenses Treatment of Long-Term Symptoms or Effects of COVID-19 Behavioral Health Care, such as Mental Health Treatment, 
substance use treatment, and other behavioral health services. Treasury recognizes that the pandemic has broadly impacted Americans' behavioral health and recipients can provide these services to the general public to respond. Enumerated eligible uses include prevention, outpatient treatment, inpatient treatment, crisis care, diversion programs, outreach to individuals not yet engaged in treatment, harm reduction and long term recovery support enhanced behavioral health services in school services for pregnant women or infants born with neonatal abstinence syndrome support for equitable access to reduce disparities in access to high quality treatment peer support groups costs for residents in supportive housing or recovery housing and the 988 national suicide prevention lifeline or other hotline services expansion of access to evidence based services for opioid use disorder prevention treatment harm reduction, and recovery behavioral health facilities and equipment, preventing and responding to violence. Recognizing that violence, and especially gun violence, has increased in some communities due to the pandemic, recipients may use funds to respond in these communities through referrals to trauma recovery services for victims of crime community violence intervention programs, including evidence-based practices like focused deterrence, with wraparound services such as behavioral therapy, trauma recovery, job training, education, housing and relocation services, and financial assistance in communities experiencing increased gun violence due to the pandemic. Comma law enforcement officers focused on advancing community policing, enforcement efforts to reduce gun violence, including prosecution, technology and equipment to support law enforcement response coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 15. U.S. Department of the Treasury responding to negative economic impacts the pandemic caused severe economic damage and, while the economy is on track to a strong recovery, much work remains to continue building a robust, resilient, and equitable economy in the wake of the crisis and to ensure that the benefits of this recovery reach all Americans. While the pandemic impacted millions of American households and businesses, some of its most severe impacts fell on low-income and underserved communities, where pre-existing disparities amplified the impact of the pandemic and where the most work remains to reach a full recovery. The final rule recognizes that the pandemic caused broad-based impacts that affected many communities, households, and small businesses across the country, for example. Many workers faced unemployment and many small businesses saw declines in revenue. The final rule describes these as impacted households, communities, small businesses, and non-profits. At the same time, the pandemic caused disproportionate impacts, or more severe impacts, in certain communities. For example, low-income and underserved communities have faced more severe health and economic outcomes like higher rates of COVID-19 mortality and unemployment often because pre-existing disparities exacerbated the impact of the pandemic. The final rule describes these as disproportionately impacted households, communities, small businesses, and non-profits. To simplify administration of the program, the final rule presumes that certain populations were impacted and disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. These populations are presumed to be eligible for services that respond to the impact they experienced. The final rule also enumerates a non-exhaustive list of eligible uses that are recognized as responsive to the impacts or disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. Recipients providing enumerated uses to populations presumed eligible are clearly operating consistently with the final rule. As discussed further in the section framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated, recipients can also identify other pandemic impacts, impacted or disproportionately impacted populations or classes, and responses. However, note that the final rule maintains that general infrastructure projects, including roads, streets, and surface transportation infrastructure, would generally not be eligible under this eligible use category. Unless the project responded to a specific pandemic public health need or a specific negative economic impact. Similarly, general economic development or workforce development, activities that do not respond to negative economic impacts of the pandemic but rather seek to more generally enhance the jurisdiction's business climate, would generally not be eligible. Under this eligible use category, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 16, U.S.
Department of the Treasury Assistance to Households Impacted Households and Communities Treasury presumes the following households and communities are impacted by the pandemic, low or moderate income households or when providing affordable housing programs, communities households that experienced unemployment households that experienced increased food or housing insecurity households that qualify for the Children's Health Insurance Program, Childcare Subsidies through the Child Care Development Fund, CCDF program, or Medicaid households that qualify for the National Housing Trust Fund and Home Investment Partnerships program when providing services to address lost instructional time in K-12 schools, any student that lost access to in-person instruction for a significant period of time low or moderate income households and communities are those with I income at or below 300% of the federal poverty guidelines for the size of the household based on the most recently published poverty guidelines or II. Income at or below 65% of the area median income for the county and size of household based on the most recently published data. For the vast majority of communities, the federal poverty guidelines are higher than the area's median income and using the federal poverty guidelines would result in more households and communities being presumed eligible. Treasury has provided an easy-to-use spreadsheet with federal poverty guidelines and area median income levels on its website. Recipients can measure income for a specific household or the median income for the community, depending on whether the response they plan to provide serves specific households or the general community. The income thresholds vary by household size. Recipients should generally use income thresholds for the appropriate household size but can use a default household size of 3 when easier for administration or when measuring income for a general community. The income limit for 300% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of 3 is $65,880 per year. 3 In other words, recipients can always presume that a household earning below this level, or a community with median income below this level, is impacted by the pandemic and eligible for services to respond. Additionally, by following the steps detailed in the section framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated, Recipients may designate additional households as impacted or disproportionately impacted beyond these presumptions, and may also pursue projects not listed below in response to these impacts consistent with Treasury Standards 3 for recipients in Alaska. The income limit for 300% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of 3 is $82.350 per year. For recipients in Hawaii, the income limit for 300% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of three is $75,780 per year. Cora Navarro State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 17. U.S. Department of the Treasury Treasury recognizes the enumerated projects below, which have been expanded under the final rule, as eligible to respond to impacts of the pandemic on households and communities. Food assistance and food banks, emergency housing assistance, rental assistance, mortgage assistance, utility assistance, assistance paying delinquent property taxes, counseling and legal aid to prevent eviction and homelessness, and emergency programs or services for homeless individuals, including temporary residences for people experiencing homelessness, health insurance coverage, expansion benefits for surviving family members of individuals who have died from COVID. 19 assistance to individuals who want and are available for work, including job training, public jobs programs and fairs, support for childcare and transportation to and from a job site or interview, incentives for newly employed workers, subsidized employment, grants to hire underserved workers, assistance to unemployed individuals to start small businesses and development of job and workforce training centers, financial services for the unbanked and underbanked burials home repair and home weatherization programs, devices and equipment for internet access and digital literacy, including subsidies for costs of access cash assistance paid sick, medical, and family leave programs assistance in accessing and applying for public benefits or services childcare and early learning services, home visiting programs, services for child welfare. Involved families and foster youth and childcare facilities assistance to address the impact of learning loss for K-12 students. For example, high-quality tutoring, differentiated instruction, programs or services to support long-term housing security.
including development of affordable housing and permanent supportive housing certain contributions to an unemployment insurance trust fund for four recipients may only use SLFRF funds for contributions to unemployment insurance trust funds and repayment of the principal amount due on advances received under Title ZI of the Social Security Act up to an amount equal to I. The difference between the balance in the recipient's unemployment insurance trust fund as of January 27, 2020 and the balance of such account as of May 17, 2021, plus II. The principal amount outstanding as of May 17, 2021 on any advances received under Title ZI of the Social Security Act between January 27, 2020 and May 17, 2021. Further, Recipients may use SLFRF funds for the payment of any interest due on such Title ZI advances. Additionally, a recipient that deposits SLFRF funds into its unemployment insurance trust fund to fully restore the pre-pandemic balance may not draw down that balance and deposit more SLFRF funds back up to the pre-pandemic balance. Recipients that deposit SLFRF funds into an unemployment insurance trust fund or use SLFRF funds to repay principal on Title ZI advances, may not take action to reduce benefits available to unemployed workers by changing the computation method governing regular unemployment compensation in a way that results in a reduction of average weekly benefit amounts or the number of weeks of benefits payable, that is, maximum benefit entitlement. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 18. U.S. Department of the Treasury disproportionately impacted households and communities Treasury presumes the following households and communities are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, low. Income households and communities Households residing in qualified census tracts Households that qualify for certain federal benefits 5. Households receiving services provided by tribal governments Households residing in the U.S. territories or receiving services from these governments low-income households and communities are those with i. income at or below 185% of the federal poverty guidelines for the size of its household based on the most recently published poverty guidelines or i. I. income at or below 40% of area median income for its county and size of household based on the most recently published data. For the vast majority of communities, the federal poverty guidelines level is higher than the area median income level and using this level would result in more households and communities being presumed eligible. Treasury has provided an easy-to-use spreadsheet with federal poverty guidelines and area median income levels on its website. Recipients can measure income for a specific household or the median income for the community, depending on whether the service they plan to provide serves specific households or the general community. The income thresholds vary by household size. Recipients should generally use income thresholds for the appropriate household size but can use a default household size of 3 when easier for administration or when measuring income for a general community. The income limit for 185% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of 3 is $40,626 per year. 6 In other words, recipients can always presume that a household earning below this level or a community with median income below this level, is disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and eligible for services to respond Five these programs are temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, Free and Reduced Price Lunch, NSLP, and or School Breakfast, SBP, programs, Medicare Part D Low Income Subsidies, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, Head Start and or Early Head Start, Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, Section 8 Vouchers, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP, and Pell Grants, for services to address educational disparities. Treasury will recognize Title I eligible schools as disproportionately impacted and responsive services that support the school generally or support the whole school as eligible six for recipients in Alaska. The income limit for 185% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of three is $50,783 per year. For recipients in Hawaii, the income limit for 185% of the federal poverty guidelines for a household of three is $46,731 per year. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 19, U.S.
Department of the Treasury Treasury recognizes the enumerated projects below, which have been expanded under the final rule, as eligible to respond to disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on households and communities. Pay for community health workers to help households access health and social services remediation of lead paint or other lead hazards primary care clinics, hospitals, integration of health services into other settings and other investments in medical equipment and facilities designed to address health disparities housing vouchers and assistance relocating to neighborhoods with higher economic opportunity investments in neighborhoods to promote improved health. Outcomes improvements to vacant and abandoned properties, including rehabilitation or maintenance, renovation, removal and remediation of environmental contaminants, demolition or deconstruction. Greening vacant lot cleanup and conversion to affordable housing 7 services to address educational disparities, including assistance to high poverty school districts and educational and evidence-based services to address student academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs schools and other educational equipment and facilities 7 Please see the final rule for further details and conditions applicable to this eligible use. This includes Treasury's presumption that demolition of vacant or abandoned residential properties that results in a net reduction in occupiable housing units for low and moderate income individuals in an area where the availability of such housing is lower than the need for such housing is ineligible for support with SLFRF funds. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 20. U.S. Department of the Treasury assistance to small businesses Small businesses have faced widespread challenges due to the pandemic, including periods of shutdown, declines in revenue, or increased costs. The final rule provides many tools for recipients to respond to the impacts of the pandemic on small businesses, or disproportionate impacts on businesses where pre-existing disparities like lack of access to capital compounded the pandemic's effects. Small businesses eligible for assistance are those that experienced negative economic impacts or disproportionate impacts of the pandemic and meet the definition of small business, specifically, 1. Have no more than 500 employees, or if applicable, the size standard in number of employees established by the administrator of the Small Business Administration for the industry in which the business concern or organization operates, and 2. For a small business concern as defined in Section 3 of the Small Business Act 8, which includes, among other requirements, that the business is independently owned and operated and is not dominant in its field of operation. Impacted small businesses recipients can identify small businesses impacted by the pandemic, and measures to respond, in many ways, for example, recipients could consider decreased revenue or gross receipts capacity to weather financial hardship financial insecurity challenges covering payroll, rent or increased costs assistance to small businesses that experienced negative economic impacts includes the following enumerated uses, loans or grants to mitigate financial hardship, such as by supporting payroll and benefits, costs to retain employees, and mortgage, rent, utility, and other operating costs disproportionately impacted small businesses technical assistance, counseling, or other services to support business planning treasury presumes that the following small businesses are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, mortgage, and other operating costs 815 USC 632, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule US, Department of the Treasury 21, US. Department of the Treasury Small Businesses Operating and Qualified Small Businesses Operating in the U.S. Census Tracts Territory Small Businesses Operated by Tribal Governments or on Tribal Lands Assistance to Disproportionately Impacted Small Businesses includes the following enumerated uses, which have been expanded under the final rule. Rehabilitation of commercial properties, storefront improvements and facade improvements technical assistance, business incubators and grants for startup or expansion costs for small businesses support for microbusinesses, including financial, childcare, and transportation costs coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 22, U.S. Department of the Treasury assistance to non-profits Non-profits have faced significant challenges due to the pandemic's increased demand for services and changing operational needs, as well as declines in revenue sources such as donations and fees. 
Non-profits eligible for assistance are those that experienced negative economic impacts or disproportionate impacts of the pandemic and meet the definition of non-profit, specifically those that are 501, c. 3, or 501, c. 19, tax-exempt organizations. Impacted non-profits recipients can identify non-profits impacted by the pandemic and measures to respond in many ways. For example, recipients could consider decreased revenue, for example, from donations and fees, financial insecurity increased costs, for example, uncompensated increases in service need, capacity to weather financial hardship challenges covering payroll, rent or mortgage, and other operating costs assistance to nonprofits that experienced negative economic impacts includes the following enumerated uses, loans or grants to mitigate financial technical or in kind assistance or other hardship services that mitigate negative economic impacts of the pandemic disproportionately impacted nonprofits treasury presumes that the following nonprofits are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic nonprofits operating in qualified census nonprofits operating in the US territories tracts nonprofits operated by tribal governments or on tribal lands recipients may identify appropriate responses that are related and reasonably proportional to addressing these disproportionate impacts. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 23. U.S. Department of the Treasury Aid to Impacted Industries Recipients may use SLFRF funding to provide aid to industries impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Recipients should first designate an impacted industry and then provide aid to address the impacted industry's negative economic impact. This subcategory of eligible uses does not separately identify disproportionate impacts and corresponding responsive services. 1. Designating an impacted industry. There are two main ways an industry can be designated as impacted. 1. If the industry is in the travel, tourism, or hospitality sectors, including tribal development districts, the industry is impacted. 2. If the industry is outside the travel, tourism, or hospitality sectors, the industry is impacted. If a. The industry experienced at least 8% employment loss from pre-pandemic levels. 9. Or B. The industry is experiencing comparable or worse economic impacts as the national tourism, travel, and hospitality industries as of the date of the final rule, based on the totality of economic indicators or qualitative data. If quantitative data is unavailable, and if the impacts were generally due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Recipients have flexibility to define industries broadly or narrowly, but Treasury encourages recipients to define narrow and discrete industries eligible for aid. State and territory recipients also have flexibility to define the industries with greater geographic precision. For example, a state may identify a particular industry in a certain region of a state as impacted to providing eligible aid to the impacted industry. Aid may only be provided to support businesses, attractions, and tribal development districts operating prior to the pandemic and affected by required closures and other efforts to contain the pandemic. Further, aid should be generally broadly available to all businesses within the impacted industry to avoid potential conflicts of interest, and Treasury encourages aid to be first used for operational expenses, such as payroll, before being used on other types of costs 9 specifically. The recipient should compare the percent change in the number of employees of the recipient's identified industry and the national leisure and hospitality sector in the three months before the pandemic's most severe impacts began. A straight three month average of seasonally adjusted employment data from December 2019, January 2020, and February 2020, with the latest data as of the final rule, a straight three month average of seasonally adjusted employment data from September 2021, October 2021, and November 2021. For parity and simplicity, smaller recipients without employment data that measure industries in their specific jurisdiction may use data available for a broader unit of government for this calculation. For example, a county may use data from the state in which it is located, a city may use data for the county, if available, or state in which it is located, solely for purposes of determining whether a particular industry is an impacted industry. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 24, U.S.
Department of the Treasury Treasury recognizes the enumerated projects below as eligible responses to impacted industries aid to mitigate financial hardship, such as supporting payroll costs, lost pay and benefits for returning employees, support of operations and maintenance of existing equipment and facilities technical assistance, counseling, or other services to support business planning COVID-19 mitigation and infection prevention measures, see section public health. As with all eligible uses, recipients may pursue a project not listed above by undergoing the steps outlined in the section framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 25. U.S. Department of the Treasury Public Sector Capacity Recipients may use SLFRF funding to restore and bolster public sector capacity which supports government's ability to deliver critical COVID-19 services. There are three main categories of eligible uses to bolster public sector capacity and workforce, public safety, public health, and human services staff, government employment and rehiring public sector staff, and effective service delivery. Public safety, public health, and human services staff SLFRF funding may be used for payroll and covered benefits for public safety, public health, health care, human services and similar employees of a recipient government. For the portion of the employee's time spent responding to COVID-19, recipients should follow the steps below 1. Identify eligible public safety, public health, and human services staff. Public safety staff include police officers, including state police officers, sheriffs and deputy sheriffs, firefighters, emergency medical responders, public health staff include Employees involved in providing medical and other physical or mental health services to patients and supervisory personnel, including medical staff assigned to schools, prisons, and other such institutions, laboratory technicians, medical examiners, morgue staff, and other support services essential for patient care. Human services staff include employees providing or administering social services and public benefits correctional and detention officers dispatchers and supervisor personnel that directly support public safety staff employees of public health departments directly engaged in public health matters and related supervisory personnel child welfare services employees to assess portion of time spent on COVID-19 response for eligible staff Recipients can use a variety of methods to assess the share of an employee's time spent responding to COVID-19, including using reasonable estimates, such as estimating the share of time based on discussions with staff and applying that share to all employees in that position. For administrative convenience, recipients can consider public health and safety employees entirely devoted to responding to COVID-19, and their payroll and benefits fully covered by SLFRF if the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 26 Child, Elder, or Family Care Employees. U.S. Department of the Treasury Employee, or his or her operating unit or division, is primarily dedicated to responding to COVID-19. Primarily dedicated means that more than half of the employee, unit, or division's time is dedicated to responding to COVID-19. Recipients must periodically reassess their determination and maintain records to support their assessment, although recipients do not need to track staff hours 3. Use SLFRF funding for payroll and covered benefits for the portion of eligible staff time spent on COVID-19 response. SLFRF funding may be used for payroll and covered benefits for the portion of the employee's time spent on COVID-19 response, as calculated above, through the period of performance. Government employment and rehiring public sector staff under the increased flexibility of the final rule, SLFRF funding may be used to support a broader set of uses to restore and support public sector employment. Eligible uses include hiring up to a pre-pandemic baseline that is adjusted for historic underinvestment in the public sector, providing additional funds for employees who experienced pay cuts or were furloughed, avoiding layoffs providing worker retention incentives, and paying for ancillary administrative costs related to hiring, support, and retention, restoring pre-pandemic employment. Recipients have two options to restore pre-pandemic employment, depending on the recipient's needs, if the recipient simply wants to hire back employees for pre-pandemic positions. Recipients may use SLFRF funds to hire employees for the same positions that existed on January 27th, 
2020 but that were unfilled or eliminated as of March 3, 2021. Recipients may use SLFRF funds to cover payroll and covered benefits for such positions through the period of performance. If the recipient wants to hire above the pre-pandemic baseline and or would like to have flexibility in positions, recipients may use SLFRF funds to pay for payroll and covered benefits associated with the recipient increasing its number of budgeted FTEs up to 7.5% above its pre-pandemic baseline. Specifically, recipients should undergo the following steps. A. Identify the recipient's budgeted FTE level on January 27, 2020. This includes all budgeted positions, filled and unfilled. This is called the pre-pandemic baseline B. Multiply the pre-pandemic baseline by 1.075. This is called the adjusted pre-pandemic baseline C. Identify the recipient's budgeted FTE level on March 3, 2021, which is the beginning of the period of performance for SLFRF funds. Recipients may, but are not required to, exclude the number of FTEs dedicated to responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency. This is called the actual number of FTEs D. Subtract the actual number of FTEs from the adjusted pre-pandemic baseline to calculate the number of FTEs that can be covered by SLFRF funds. Recipients do not have to hire for the same roles that existed pre-pandemic. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 27. U.S. Department of the Treasury recipients may use SLFRF funds to cover payroll and covered benefits through the period of performance. These employees must have begun their employment on or after March 3, 2021. Recipients may only use SLFRF funds for additional FTEs hired over March 3, 2021 level, that is, the actual number of FTEs, supporting and retaining public sector workers. Recipients can also use funds in other ways that support the public sector workforce. Ten these include, o providing additional funding for employees who experienced pay reductions or were furloughed since the onset of the pandemic, up to the difference in the employee's pay, taking into account unemployment benefits received o maintaining current compensation levels to prevent layoffs. SLFRF funds may be used to maintain current compensation levels, with adjustments for inflation, in order to prevent layoffs that would otherwise be necessary or providing worker retention incentives, including reasonable increases in compensation to persuade employees to remain with the employer as compared to other employment options. Retention incentives must be entirely additive to an employee's regular compensation, narrowly tailored to need and should not exceed incentives traditionally offered by the recipient or compensation that alternative employers may offer to compete for the employees. Treasury presumes that retention incentives that are less than 25% of the rate of base pay for an individual employee or 10% for a group or category of employees are reasonably proportional to the need to retain employees. As long as other requirements are met, covering administrative costs associated with administering the hiring, support, and retention programs above. Effective service delivery SLFRF funding may be used to improve the efficacy of public health and economic programs through tools like program evaluation, data, and outreach, as well as to address administrative needs caused or exacerbated by the pandemic. Eligible uses include supporting program evaluation, data, and outreach through 10 recipients should be able to substantiate that these uses of funds are substantially due to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, for example, fiscal pressures on state and local budgets, and respond to its impacts. See the final rule for details on these uses. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 28. Comma program evaluation and evidence resources data analysis resources to gather, assess, share, and use data technology infrastructure to improve access to and the user experience of government IT systems, as well as technology improvements to increase public access and delivery of government programs and services addressing administrative needs, including administrative costs for programs responding to the public health emergency and its economic impacts, including non-SLFRF and non-federally funded programs community outreach and engagement activities capacity building resources to support using data and evidence, including hiring staff, consultants, or technical assistance support address administrative needs caused or exacerbated by the pandemic, including addressing backlogs caused by shutdowns, 
increased repair or maintenance needs, and technology infrastructure to adapt government operations to the pandemic, for example, video conferencing software, data and case management systems, U.S. Department of the Treasury Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 29, U.S. Department of the Treasury Capital Expenditures as described above, the final rule clarifies that recipients may use funds for programs, services, and capital expenditures that respond to the public health and negative economic impacts of the pandemic. Any use of funds in this category for a capital expenditure must comply with the capital expenditure requirements, in addition to other standards for uses of funds. Capital expenditures are subject to the same eligibility standard as other eligible uses to respond to the pandemic's public health and economic impacts, specifically. They must be related and reasonably proportional to the pandemic impact identified and reasonably designed to benefit the impacted population or class. For ease of administration, the final rule identifies enumerated types of capital expenditures that Treasury has identified as responding to the pandemic's impacts. These are listed in the applicable subcategory of eligible uses, for example, public health, assistance to households, etc. Recipients may also identify other responsive capital expenditures. Similar to other eligible uses in the SLFRF program, no pre approval is required for capital expenditures. To guide recipients' analysis of whether a capital expenditure meets the eligibility standard, recipients, with the exception of tribal governments, must complete and meet the requirements of a written justification for capital expenditures equal to or greater than $1 million. For large-scale capital expenditures, which have high costs and may require an extended length of time to complete, as well as most capital expenditures for non-enumerated uses of funds, Treasury requires recipients to submit their written justification as part of regular reporting. Specifically, less than $1 no written justification required no written justification required million if a project has total capital expenditures of and the uses enumerated by Treasury as eligible, then and the uses beyond those enumerated by Treasury as eligible, then greater than or equal to $1 million, but less than $10 million written justification required but recipients are not required to submit as part of regular reporting to Treasury written justification required and recipients must submit as part of regular reporting to Treasury. $10 million or more written justification required and recipients must submit as part of regular reporting to Treasury A written justification includes description of the harm or need to be addressed. Recipients should provide a description of the specific harm or need to be addressed and why the harm was exacerbated or caused by the public health emergency. Recipients may provide quantitative information on the extent and the type of harm, such as the number of individuals or entities affected. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 30, U.S. Department of the Treasury, Explanation of Why a Capital Expenditure is Appropriate. For example, recipients should include an explanation of why existing equipment and facilities, or policy changes or additional funding to pertinent programs or services, would be inadequate. Comparison of proposed capital project against at least two alternative capital expenditures and demonstration of why the proposed capital expenditure is superior. Recipients should consider the effectiveness of the capital expenditure in addressing the harm identified and the expected total cost including pre-development costs, against at least two alternative capital expenditures. Where relevant, recipients should consider the alternatives of improving existing capital assets already owned or leasing other capital assets. Treasury presumes that the following capital projects are generally ineligible. Construction of new correctional facilities as a response to an increase in rate of crime construction of new congregate facilities to decrease spread of COVID. 19 in the facility construction of convention centers, stadiums, or other large capital projects intended for general economic development or to aid impacted industries in undertaking capital expenditures. Treasury encourages recipients to adhere to strong labor standards, including project labor agreements and community benefits agreements that offer wages at or above the prevailing rate and include local hire provisions. Treasury also encourages recipients to prioritize in their procurements employers with high labor standards and to prioritize employers without recent violations of federal and state labor and employment laws. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S.
Department of the Treasury 31, U.S. Department of the Treasury Framework for eligible uses beyond those enumerated as described above, recipients have broad flexibility to identify and respond to other pandemic impacts and serve other populations that experienced pandemic impacts. Beyond the enumerated uses and presumed eligible populations, recipients should undergo the following steps to decide whether their project is eligible. Step 1. Identify COVID-19 public health or economic impact 2. Design a response that addresses or responds to the impact analysis, can identify impact to a specific household, business or non-profit or to a class of households, businesses or non-profits, that is, group. Comma can also identify disproportionate impacts, or more severe impacts, to a specific beneficiary or to a class. Types of responses can include a program, service, or capital expenditure. Response should be related and reasonably proportional to the harm. Response should also be reasonably designed to benefit impacted individual or class 1. Identify a COVID-19 public health or negative economic impact on an individual or a class. Recipients should identify an individual or class that is impacted or disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 public health emergency or its negative economic impacts as well as the specific impact itself. Impacted entities are those impacted by the disease itself or the harmful consequences of the economic disruptions resulting from or exacerbated by the COVID-19 public health emergency. For example, an individual who lost their job or a small business that saw lower revenue during a period of closure would both have experienced impacts of the pandemic. Disproportionately impacted entities are those that experienced disproportionate public health or economic outcomes from the pandemic. Treasury recognizes that pre-existing disparities, in many cases, amplified the impacts of the pandemic, causing more severe impacts in underserved communities. For example, a household living in a neighborhood with limited access to medical care and healthy foods may have faced health disparities before the pandemic, like a higher rate of chronic health conditions, that contributed to more severe health outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic. The recipient may choose to identify these impacts at either the individual level or at a class level. If the recipient is identifying impacts at the individual level, they should retain documentation supporting the impact the individual experienced, for example, documentation of lost revenues from a small business. Such documentation can be streamlined in many cases, for example, self-attestation that a household requires food assistance. Recipients also have broad flexibility to identify a class or a group of households, small businesses, or non-profits, that experienced an impact. In these cases, the recipients should call Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 32, U.S. Department of the Treasury first identify the class and the impact that it faced. Then, recipients only need to document that the individual served fall within that class. Recipients do not need to document a specific impact to each individual served. For example, a recipient could identify that restaurants in the downtown area faced substantial declines in revenue due to decreased foot traffic from workers. The recipient could develop a program to respond to the impact on that class and only needs to document that the businesses being served are restaurants in the downtown area. Recipients should keep the following considerations in mind when designating a class. There should be a relationship between the definition of the class and the proposed response. Larger and less specific classes are less likely to have experienced similar harms, which may make it more difficult to design a response that appropriately responds to those harms. Classes may be determined on a population basis or on a geographic basis, and the response should be appropriately matched. For example, a response might be designed to provide childcare to single parents, regardless of which neighborhood they live in. Or a response might provide a park to improve the health of a disproportionately impacted neighborhood. Recipients may designate classes that experience disproportionate impact. By assessing the impacts of the pandemic and finding that some populations experienced meaningfully more severe impacts than the general public. To determine these disproportionate impacts, recipients o may designate classes based on academic research or government research publications, such as the citations provided in the supplementary information in the final rule, through analysis of their own data, or through analysis of other existing data sources o may also consider qualitative research and sources to augment their analysis, or when quantitative data is not readily available.
Such sources might include resident interviews or feedback from relevant state and local agencies, such as public health departments or social services departments or should consider the quality of the research, data, and applicability of analysis to their determination in all cases. Some of the enumerated uses may also be appropriate responses to the impacts experienced by other classes of beneficiaries. It is permissible for recipients to provide these services to other classes, so long as the recipient determines that the response is also appropriate for those groups. Recipients may designate a class based on income level, including at levels higher than the final rule definition of low and moderate income. For example, the recipient may identify that households in their community with incomes above the final rule threshold for low income nevertheless experience disproportionate impacts from the pandemic and provide responsive services to design a response that addresses or responds to the impact. Programs, services, and other interventions must be reasonably designed to benefit the individual or class that experienced coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 33, U.S. Department of the Treasury The Impact. They must also be related and reasonably proportional to the extent and type of impact experienced. For example, uses that bear no relation or are grossly disproportionate to the type or extent of the impact would not be eligible. Reasonably proportional refers to the scale of the response compared to the scale of the harm, as well as the targeting of the response to beneficiaries compared to the amount of harm they experienced. For example, it may not be reasonably proportional for a cash assistance program to provide a very small amount of aid to a group that experienced severe harm and a much larger amount to a group that experienced relatively little harm. Recipients should consider relevant factors about the harm identified and the response to evaluate whether the response is reasonably proportional. For example, recipients may consider the size of the population impacted and the severity, type, and duration of the impact. Recipients may also consider the efficacy, cost, cost effectiveness, and time to delivery of the response. For disproportionately impacted communities, recipients may design interventions that address broader pre existing disparities that contributed to more severe health and economic outcomes during the pandemic, such as disproportionate gaps in access to health care or pre existing disparities in educational outcomes that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 34. 1. Identify an eligible worker. Eligible workers include workers needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors. These sectors and occupations are eligible. 2. Beyond this list, the chief executive, or equivalent, of a recipient government may designate additional non-public sectors as critical so long as doing so is necessary to protecting the health and well-being of the residents of such jurisdictions. Verify that the eligible worker performs essential work, meaning work that, is not performed while teleworking from a residence, and, involves either, health care emergency response sanitation, disinfection and cleaning maintenance grocery stores, restaurants, food production, and food delivery pharmacy biomedical research behavioral health medical testing and diagnostics home and community. Based health care or assistance with activities of daily living family or child care social services public health mortuary critical clinical research, development, and testing necessary for COVID-19 response state, local, or tribal government workforce workers providing vital services to tribes educational, school nutrition, and other work required to operate a school facility laundry election solid waste or hazardous materials management, response, and cleanup work requiring physical interaction with patients dental care transportation and warehousing hotel and commercial lodging facilities that are used for COVID-19 mitigation and containment U.S. Department of the Treasury premium pay The coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds may be used to provide premium pay to eligible workers performing essential work during the pandemic. Premium pay may be awarded to eligible workers up to $13 per hour. Premium pay must be in addition to wages or remuneration, that is, compensation, the eligible worker otherwise receives. Premium pay may not exceed $25,000 for any single worker during the program. Recipients should undergo the following steps to provide premium pay to eligible workers a b regular, in-person interactions with patients, the public, or co-workers of the individual that is performing the work, or regular physical handling of items that were handled by, or are to be handled by, 
patients, the public, or co-workers of the individual that is performing the work. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 35, U.S. Department of the Treasury 3, confirm that the premium pay responds to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Under the final rule, which broadened the share of eligible workers who can receive premium pay without a written justification, recipients may meet this requirement in one of three ways. Eligible worker receiving premium pay is earning, with the premium included, at or below 150% of their residing state or county's average annual wage for all occupations, as defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Employment and Wage Statistics, whichever is higher, on an annual basis, or, eligible worker receiving premium pay is not exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime provisions, or, if a worker does not meet either of the above requirements. The recipient must submit written justification to Treasury detailing how the premium pay is otherwise responsive to workers performing essential work during the public health emergency. This may include a description of the essential worker's duties, health, or financial risks faced due to COVID-19, and why the recipient determined that the premium pay was responsive. Treasury anticipates that recipients will easily be able to satisfy the justification requirement for frontline workers, like nurses and hospital staff. Premium pay may be awarded in installments or lump sums, for example, monthly, quarterly, etc., and may be awarded to hourly, part-time, or salaried or non-hourly workers. Premium pay must be paid in addition to wages already received and may be paid retrospectively. The recipient may not use SLFRF to merely reimburse itself for premium pay or hazard pay already received by the worker, and premium pay may not be paid to volunteers. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 36, U.S. Department of the Treasury Water and Sewer Infrastructure The Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds may be used to make necessary investments in water and sewer infrastructure. State, local, and tribal governments have a tremendous need to address the consequences of deferred maintenance in drinking water systems and removal, management, and treatment of sewage and stormwater, along with additional resiliency measures needed to adapt to climate change. Recipients may undertake the eligible projects below, projects eligible under EPA's Clean Water State Revolving Fund, CWSRF, eligible projects under the CWSRF, and the final rule, include, construction of publicly owned treatment works projects pursuant to implementation of a non-point source pollution management program established under the Clean Water Act, CWA. Decentralized wastewater treatment systems that treat municipal wastewater or domestic sewage management and treatment of stormwater or subsurface drainage water water conservation, efficiency, or reuse measures development and implementation of a conservation and management plan under the CWA watershed projects meeting the criteria set forth in the CWA energy consumption reduction for publicly owned treatment works reuse or recycling of wastewater stormwater, or subsurface drainage water security of publicly owned treatment works Treasury encourages recipients to review the EPA handbook for the CWSRF for a full list of eligibilities. Projects eligible under EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, DWSRF, eligible drinking water projects under the DWSRF, and the final rule, include, facilities to improve drinking water quality transmission and distribution including improvements of water pressure or prevention of contamination in infrastructure and lead service line replacements new sources to replace contaminated drinking water or increase drought resilience, including aquifer storage and recovery system for water storage green infrastructure, including green roofs, rainwater harvesting collection, permeable pavement storage of drinking water such as to prevent contaminants or equalize water demons purchase of water systems and interconnection of systems new community water systems treasury encourages recipients to review the EPA handbook for the DWSRF for a full list of eligibilities. Coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 37, U.S. Department of the Treasury Additional Eligible Projects with Broadened Eligibility Under the Final Rule, SLFRF funds may be used to fund additional types of projects, such as additional stormwater infrastructure, 
residential wells, lead remediation, and certain rehabilitations of dams and reservoirs, beyond the CWSRF and DWSRF, if they are found to be necessary according to the definition provided in the final rule and outlined below culvert repair, resizing, and removal, replacement of storm sewers, and additional types of stormwater infrastructure infrastructure to improve access to safe drinking water for individuals served by residential wells, including testing initiatives and treatment remediation strategies that address contamination dam and reservoir rehabilitation if primary purpose of dam or reservoir is for drinking water supply and project is necessary for provision of drinking water a necessary investment in infrastructure must be broad set of lead remediation projects eligible under EPA grant programs authorized by the water infrastructure improvements for the nation we Ein, act such as lead testing installation of corrosion control treatment lead service line replacement, as well as water quality testing, compliance monitoring, and remediation activities, including replacement of internal plumbing and faucets and fixtures in schools and childcare facilities, 1. Responsive to an identified need to achieve or maintain an adequate minimum level of service, which may include a reasonable projection of increased need, whether due to population growth or otherwise, 2. A cost. Effective means for meeting that need taking into account available alternatives, and, three, for investments in infrastructure that supply drinking water in order to meet projected population growth, projected to be sustainable over its estimated useful life. Please note that DWSRF and CWSRF eligible projects are generally presumed to be necessary investments. Additional eligible projects generally must be responsive to an identified need to achieve or maintain an adequate minimum level of service. Recipients are only required to assess cost effectiveness of projects for the creation of new drinking water systems, dam and reservoir rehabilitation projects, or projects for the extension of drinking water service to meet population growth needs. Recipients should review the supplementary information to the final rule for more details on requirements applicable to each type of investment. Applicable standards and requirements Treasury encourages recipients to adhere to strong labor standards including project labor agreements and community benefits agreements that offer wages at or above the prevailing rate and include local hire provisions. Treasury also encourages recipients to prioritize in their procurements employers with high labor standards and to prioritize employers without recent violations of federal and state labor and employment laws. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 38 U.S. Department of the Treasury Broadband Infrastructure The coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds may be used to make necessary investments in broadband infrastructure, which has been shown to be critical for work, education, healthcare, and civic participation during the public health emergency. The final rule broadens the set of eligible broadband infrastructure investments that recipients may undertake. Recipients may pursue investments in broadband infrastructure meeting technical standards detailed below, as well as an expanded set of cybersecurity investments. Broadband infrastructure investments recipients should adhere to the following requirements when designing a broadband infrastructure project. 1. Identify an eligible area for investment. Recipients are encouraged to prioritize projects that are designed to serve locations without access to reliable wireline 100-20 Mbps broadband service, meaning service that reliably provides 100 megabits per second download speed and 20 megabits per second upload speed through a wireline connection, but are broadly able to invest in projects designed to provide service to locations with an identified need for additional broadband investment. Recipients have broad flexibility to define need in their community. Examples of need could include, lack of access to a reliable high, speed lack of affordable broadband broadband connection lack of reliable service if recipients are considering deploying broadband to locations where there are existing and enforceable federal or state funding commitments for reliable service of, at least 100-20 Mbps. Recipients must ensure that SLFRF funds are designed to address an identified need for additional broadband investment that is not met by existing federal or state funding commitments. Recipients must also ensure that SLFRF funds will not be used for costs that will be reimbursed by the other federal or state funding streams to design project to meet high-speed technical standards. Recipients are required to design projects to, upon completion, 
reliably meet or exceed symmetrical 100 megabits per second download and upload speeds. In cases where it is not practicable, because of the excessive cost of the project or geography or topography of the area to be served by the project, eligible projects may be designed to reliably meet or exceed 100-20 Mbps and be scalable to a minimum of symmetrical 100 megabits per second download and upload speeds. Treasury encourages recipients to prioritize investments in fiber optic infrastructure wherever feasible and to focus on projects that will achieve last mile connections. Further, Treasury encourages recipients to prioritize support for broadband networks owned, operated by, or affiliated with local governments, non-profits, and cooperatives. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 39, U.S. Department of the Treasury 3, Require Enrollment in a Low-Income Subsidy Program. Recipients must require the service provider for a broadband project that provides service to households to either participate in the FCC's Affordable Provide Access to a Broad-Based Connectivity Program, (AP) Affordability Program to Low Income Consumers that provides benefits commensurate to ACT Treasury encourages broadband services to also include at least one low cost option offered without data usage caps at speeds sufficient for a household with multiple users to simultaneously telework and engage in remote learning. Recipients are also encouraged to consult with the community on affordability needs. Cybersecurity investments SLFRF may be used for modernization of cybersecurity for existing and new broadband infrastructure, regardless of their speed delivery standards. This includes modernization of hardware and software. Applicable standards and requirements Treasury encourages recipients to adhere to strong labor standards, including project labor agreements and community benefits agreements that offer wages at or above the prevailing rate and include local hire provisions. Treasury also encourages recipients to prioritize in their procurements employers with high labor standards and to prioritize employers without recent violations of federal and state labor and employment laws. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 40, U.S. Department of the Treasury Restrictions on Use While recipients have considerable flexibility to use coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds to address the diverse needs of their communities, some restrictions on use of funds apply. Offset A reduction in net tax revenue. States and territories may not use this funding to directly or indirectly offset a reduction in net tax revenue resulting from a change in law, regulation, or administrative interpretation beginning on March 3, 2021, through the last day of the fiscal year in which the funds provided have been spent. If a state or territory cuts taxes during this period, it must demonstrate how it paid for the tax cuts from sources other than SLFRF such as by enacting policies to raise other sources of revenue, by cutting spending, or through higher revenue due to economic growth. If the funds provided have been used to offset tax cuts, the amount used for this purpose must be repaid to the Treasury. Deposits into pension funds, no recipients except tribal governments may use this funding to make a deposit to a pension fund. Treasury defines a deposit as an extraordinary contribution to a pension fund for the purpose of reducing an accrued, unfunded liability. While pension deposits are prohibited, recipients may use funds for routine payroll contributions connected to an eligible use of funds, for example, for public health and safety staff. Examples of extraordinary payments include ones that reduce a liability incurred prior to the start of the COVID. 19 public health emergency and occur outside the recipient's regular timing for making the payment additional restrictions and requirements occur at the regular time for pension contributions but is larger than a regular payment would have been. Additional restrictions and requirements that apply across all eligible use categories include no debt service or replenishing financial reserves. Since SLFRF funds are intended to be used prospectively, Recipients may not use SLFRF funds for debt service or replenishing financial reserves, for example, rainy day funds, no satisfaction of settlements and judgments, satisfaction of any obligation arising under or pursuant to a settlement agreement, judgment, consent decree, or judicially confirmed debt restructuring in a judicial, administrative, or regulatory proceeding is itself not an eligible use. However, if a settlement requires the recipient to provide services or incur other costs that are an eligible use of SLFRF funds, SLFRF may be used for those costs.
Additional general restrictions. SLFRF funds may not be used for a project that conflicts with or contravenes the purpose of the American Rescue Plan Act statute. For example, uses of funds that coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 41. U.S. Department of the Treasury undermine COVID-19 mitigation practices in line with CDC guidance and recommendations, and may not be used in violation of the award terms and conditions or conflict of interest requirements under the uniform guidance. Other applicable laws and regulations, outside of SLFRF program requirements, may also apply, for example, laws around procurement, contracting, conflicts of interest, environmental standards, or civil rights. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 42, U.S. Department of the Treasury Program Administration The Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Final Rule details a number of administrative processes and requirements, including on distribution of funds, timeline for use of funds, transfer of funds, treatment of loans, use of funds to meet non-federal match or cost share requirements, administrative expenses, reporting on use of funds, and remediation and recoupment of funds used for ineligible purposes. This section provides a summary for the most frequently asked questions. Timeline for use of funds under the SLFRF. Funds must be used for costs incurred on or after March 3, 2021. Further, costs must be obligated by December 31, 2024, and expended by December 31, 2026. Transfers recipients may undertake projects on their own or through subrecipients, which carry out eligible uses on behalf of a recipient, including pooling funds with other recipients or blending and braiding SLFRF funds with other sources of funds. Localities may also transfer their funds to the state through Section 603, C, 4, which will decrease the locality's award and increase the state award amounts. Loans recipients may generally use SLFRF funds to provide loans for uses that are otherwise eligible, although there are special rules about how recipients should track program income depending on the length of the loan. Recipients should consult the final rule if they seek to utilize these provisions. Non-federal match or cost share requirements funds available under the Revenue Loss Eligible Use Category, Section 602, C, 1, C, and 603, C, 1. C, of the Social Security Act, generally may be used to meet the non-federal cost, share or matching requirements of other federal programs. However, note that SLFRF funds may not be used as the non-federal share for purposes of a state's Medicaid and CHIP programs because the Office of Management and Budget has approved a waiver as requested by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services pursuant to 2 CFR 200.102 of the Uniform Guidance and Related regulations. SLFRF funds beyond those that are available under the revenue loss eligible use category may not be used to meet the non federal match or cost share requirements of other federal programs, other than as specifically provided for by statute. As an example, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides that SLFRF funds may be used to meet the non federal match requirements of authorized Bureau of Reclamation projects and certain broadband deployment projects. Recipients should consult the final rule for further details if they seek to utilize SLFRF funds as a match for these projects. Administrative expenses SLFRF funds may be used for direct and indirect administrative expenses involved in administering the program. For details on permissible direct and indirect administrative costs, recipients should refer to Treasury's compliance and reporting guidance. Costs incurred for the same purpose in like circumstances must be treated consistently as either direct or indirect costs. Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, Overview of the Final Rule U.S. Department of the Treasury 43, U.S. Department of the Treasury Reporting, Compliance and Recoupment Recipients are required to comply with Treasury's Compliance and Reporting Guidance, which includes submitting mandatory periodic reports to Treasury. Funds used in violation of the final rule are subject to remediation and recoupment. As outlined in the final rule, Treasury may identify funds used in violation through reporting or other sources. Recipients will be provided with an initial written notice of recoupment with an opportunity to submit a request for reconsideration before Treasury provides a final notice of recoupment.
If the recipient receives an initial notice of recoupment and does not submit a request for reconsideration, the initial notice will be deemed the final notice. Treasury may pursue other forms of remediation and monitoring in conjunction with, or as an alternative to, recoupment. Revisions to the overview of the final rule, January 18, 2022, page 4, page 16. Clarification that the revenue loss standard allowance is up to $10 million under the replacing lost public sector revenue eligible use category. Addition of further information on the eligibility of general infrastructure, general economic development, and worker development projects under the public health and negative economic impacts eligible use category. For a NABRA state and local fiscal recovery funds, overview of the final rule U.S. Department of the Treasury for Fiscal.